guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist, where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. Guys, ever since I started this channel, many of you keep sending me links and saying, Vaughn, check this out, check that out, and I've learned and discovered a lot of good music through you, my subscribers. But a name that kept coming up quite often was a name, Assemblage 23. And I remember checking them out, and the very first song I heard of theirs was a song called Damaged and it instantly made a huge impact on me. So I reached out to Tom Shear, who is the man behind Assemblage 23, and I'm pleased to say that I managed to interview him. So let's go straight into that interview. Tom Shear from uh, As As Assemblage 23 or Assemblage, how we say it? Assemblage 23. As Assemblage. Tom, um, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to to um, chat with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've heard good things from many people, actually, and uh, I think that you have... All lies. <laughs> All lies. <laughs> you, you pay them money to say it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the band Mesh here in the UK, mm. you, you're familiar with them. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. They reached out to me, and it's been fascinating with this channel. I've met you know people that I've been listening to and looking up to. It's so surreal to be able, able to talk to them. And um, so Richard from Mesh just emailed me because uh, I'm going to be interviewing them, and he's and they they had such lovely things to say about you, and said you're like the most humble guy. Oh, that's that's very nice of them. That's and, cool. And uh, it's quite interesting. I, I get that vibe from you, as I say. Um, I think I should just talk about how I first discovered you. You know, obviously on the channel, I've started the channel, and it's it's been really. I mean, I started the channel about ten months ago. Uh, I started it as like a tutorial channel. Anyway, long story short, I just realized I didn't want to be teaching people how to play piano because it's too laborious. So I started <laughs> off talking about act. I just went to a Gary Newman concert one night and I came back and I thought, oh, let me talk about this Gary Newman concert. And that seemed to resonate with people. Then I started talking about the Pesh mode and that really opened a, a can of worms. Sure. <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. And so as a result, we've got this uh, on the channel. We talk about piano, keyboard, arts, synthesizers and stuff. And the reason I'm telling you this is is because I get a lot of people saying, oh, Vaughn, you should listen to this, you should listen to this. So I get loads of recommendations. Right. And someone came with Assemblage 23. And for some reason, I recognized that that name, but I couldn't understand why I'd recognized it. But anyway, to be honest, it was recommended to me a few times. And then one day, someone just put them on wall. They said, have you listened to Assemblage 23? With us? I was like, oh, my God, sake, let me just listen to this. <laughs> Very often people send you stuff and it's like, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to like it. And it, it's difficult because sure. we, you know, we're so inundated with information. But I'll tell you what, Tom, and I don't want to flatter you, the first song I heard from you was Damaged. And when I put that on, it was like my neck hairs went. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> it was, it was the same. It was almost the same reaction I got when I heard Enjoy the Science for the first time. Wow, it thank was, you. No, and it's I, it's, I listened to that and then... But I tell you what, and then I heard a song called Lullaby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my God. And I don't want to sound cheesy, but I listened to it at night once, and I was reading the lyrics, and I promise you, tears came streaming down my cheeks. Oh. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, my God, this is an artist. This is someone I really can you know, can get, get my, my, my teeth into, uh, not, uh, metaphorically speaking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> So I really went on a trip and I listened to your stuff and I, I just wish I knew who the, um, the person was who recommended it to me. I wanted to say thank you to them, but I did get your email address from, uh, is it Sonia? One of my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he said he popped up and went, Oh, you can, I, I can put you in touch with Tom. He's a really nice guy. And uh, so I want to say thank you to him, but where I'm, I'm really going to let you talk. It was just, I want to just let you know how I discovered you. It's not often when someone introduces me to something like this that I could really, that it really, I'm like blown away by it. So thank you. That's very, very flattering. Not many to, to flatter you. I've, I've steamrolled over you now. <laughs> but I, I want to get into some questions now. So you started in 1988. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. I'd, I'd been doing uh, electronic music for a bit longer than that, but that was around the time that I started to. Uh, discover like the first two human league albums yeah. um and and some uh ma material that was a little bit uh, darker than just pure synth pop kind of stuff yeah. and um 
so that's where I kind of started writing this kind of music. And um, it was quite a bit different back then as well, but, you know, as you would expect from something that long ago. Yeah. Now, um, so your influences are really, as you, you mentioned off the bat, the Human League, so like the early Human League? Yes, I, I mean, I, I really like most of the Human League, but the, you know, Reproduction and Travelogue, I think, are incredible albums. And for the people who only know them for their hits, I think they would be just surprised at how artistic and, and dark those albums are. Uh, you mentioned Gary Newman before. Um, yeah. He him. was the first guy that I... Cars was the first song where I really noticed a synthesizer. Uh, okay. You know, I know I my aunt was really into Rick Wakeman back in the day when I was very young. And so I know I, I'd heard electronic music before, but when I heard those strings come in and the sort of white noise drums in the back, my ears pricked up and I was like, what is that? You know, I want to be a part of whatever that is. So... Um, you know, that really altered the course of my life in a huge way, just hearing that uh, oh. that one song. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Depeche Mode, of course, were a big influence. Uh, Front 242, Knights of Reb, um, mm -hmm. Those were all bands that were very uh, important to me in my, my formative musical years. It's interesting, Tom, because I, the, when I heard the music for the first time, and then when I Googled you, I was surprised to hear you were American. And yeah. it's quite funny because a lot of my uh, American subscribers and a lot of my uh, Australian subscribers often moan that, uh, uh, well, uh, in their words, not what I'm saying, uh, a lot of them have said that they feel that the Australian music scene and the American music scene are not as innovative as the British and Europe music scene. They feel that, in a, uh, to quote one of your fellow countrymen, uh, uh, one of my subscribers, he said in America, he said, all we have in America are country artists and hip hop clones. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I there, there are. It, it's interesting when I heard your music. I just assumed that you were from Europe or something, or from Germany, and that is probably why you are very popular in Germany. I mean, it's a massive sure. market, and you're, yeah. you're very popular in Eastern Europe and Russia as well. In that part of yeah. the world, yeah. And you know, I was um, having a rant on my channel the other day, Tom, and I was kind of saying I don't know what it's like in America, but certainly here in the UK, there seems to be this horrible sort of corporate thing that's taking over like we don't have any more music venues really you like they'll yeah. get rid of like a a rock and roll venue and they'll turn it into like a, a a trendy wine bar with a dj you know and then yeah you know there's just no places where musicians can jam and hang out but um anyway uh com coming back onto onto the topic of of you and everything you and i actually have something in common okay we have a lot in common with music and stuff but the penny dropped the other day when, because I, I recognized the name Assemblage 23, and then I realized you and I both did a remix for Combi Christ. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I would explain it then. Can't change the beat. Do, do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do. And this must have been in 2008. That sounds about right. That's right. Yes, I was being managed by um, someone in America called Jason Fiber. Uh, yeah, I know Jason. Do you know Jason? Yeah. Oh, and is he still around? He's not doing management anymore. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah he's. He's he's still kicking around. He's uh, no, he's a, he's a really good guy, and he really helped me a lot. You know, just he kind of picked me up, and he got me a lot of remix work. And can't change the beat from Combi Christ. Cool. Was. And that's of course where I remember the penny dropped, and I. But uh, yeah, makes I, sense. And not to flatter you, but yeah, your production was much better than mine back then. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> now, um, if we talk about production, I've made a few notes here, but I just like to sort of free flow of the conversation sure. you say started off in 1988 and there's talk um if the, if we are to believe wikipedia uh, they said you started off with a name with a name called man on a stage is that right right it right right yeah it's a it's a line from a, an old devo song called planet earth okay uh the line goes i saw a man on a stage scream let me out of my cage yeah. and i just i don't know why i latched onto it i was a big devo fan as well yeah uh, uh, but yeah, I was using that, and at that point, really nobody else was hearing my music. It was something that I was doing on my own, but uh, I didn't really know people who were in the same... I, I grew up in a pretty rural area, so to oh, say that there wasn't really an electronic music scene there is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, really putting it mildly. So uh, yeah, that was that was prior to the A23. That was the, the name that I used. And um, 
And apparently, uh, I've also read that you were quite reluctant to sing. You didn't see yourself as a singer. You were more, uh, yeah, or you were too shy. And I mean, look uh, at you. Look little at from you. column A and column B. You know, I didn't really. Um, I mean, singing wasn't something that I really did. Mm. And um, you know, I, I think to anybody who starts out singing, that's kind of an intimidating thing, oh, yeah. especially if it comes to live performance, you know, standing up in front of a room full of strangers Absolutely, yeah. is, a, is a very vulnerable position to be in. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't know anybody who even knew who Depeche Mode was or any of these bands that I listened to. So I didn't, I couldn't find anybody really to, to fill that role. Mm. So I kind of did it out of necessity and, um, yeah, I'm still doing it now. So, <laughs> well, that's good. Cause I mean, you've managed to you know, forge a full-time career doing that, which is very difficult these days. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, um, I, I Googled up some of the uh, live footage you did, and I saw you um, doing a gig. I think it was, was it in, uh, it was kind of like a club scene, but you never had a band. You just had a guy behind you, kind of like a DJ. Uh, obviously, you had your music on backing tracks, and you were just standing in the, st in the front singing. So, I guess what I'm asking is you've obviously got different configurations for when you perform live. Like sometimes you have a live band. Mm -hmm. so is that just dependent on the venue or the budget or how does that work? Um, it's usually a budgetary thing. Like yeah. our normal lineup is I have um, Paul Seegers plays keyboards for me and he's been with me since yes. 1996. Okay. So he's been with me a very long time. And then I've got a great drummer named Mike Jenny um, okay. and he, he plays drums and, uh, you know, with the amount of gigs that we do um, in Europe, uh, flight costs you know, are quite expensive. Uh, you know, if you have to get visas and that stuff, that adds to expenses. So there's times where I can only take one of them along with me. I oh, I see. Okay. So it's just a practical matter, really. It's true because um, it's interesting how it, it's the budget thing and you need to scale. In an ideal world, we'd like to have the two, you know, you know, you know the visual element, like if you watch Gary Newman, he's got the two keyboard players, the sure. drummers, but you, you obviously have to compensate and make, you know, cut it as to, you know, for, for, to make it financially viable. So you don't bank yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 If, if, I mean, if I wanted to not make any money doing it, then uh, that would be a different matter. But, uh, you know, I, I've got to send my guys home with uh, something or their, their wives get pretty irate. And, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, have you ever played in the UK, Tom? Oh, yes, all the time. Uh, have you? Oh, you do. So, so, so you, you've played with, um, is it Mesh? You, prob you probably know them quite well. Uh, yes, I do know them, uh, but we ha I don't think we've played any shows together in the UK. Uh, we, we've uh, played a couple shows in Germany together, kind of festival-type gigs. I see. Um, but, yeah, we... we um, I don't know. We tour the UK probably once every two years or so. Um, okay. Usually start in Glasgow and then work our way down to uh, London. So, where would you say is your biggest your biggest fan base? Where where are people the most intense? Um, probably the US. Uh, oh right. Um, oh, you've got a home. It, you've got a home home following. Yeah. Um, that's great. It, it used to be, uh, we used to have, it was pretty much 50-50 between Germany and the U.S., but uh, it's more weighted towards the U.S. now. Mm. Um, so U.S., you know, Canada, Germany are the big ones. Um, U.K. is also good for us. Uh, Sweden is good for us. Uh, Russia is something that we've started doing the past, mm. I don't know, 10 years, and that's been going really well. Yeah. Um, but those are the main ones. I see. And it's quite interesting because um, on my channel, I've just been interviewing Brian Griffin, you know, the Depeche Mode. He, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. And um, he's he's rolled out this offer where we can – well, because his original prints are quite expensive. Yeah. I, I went to him and I said, look, Brian, is there any way you can do something for the channel where I can make your artwork accessible to my – yeah, you know, to the normal people, and sure. uh, he brought out a series. And the reason I'm telling you this is because all the sales, most well, most of the sales are to Germans, the Swedes, you know, the Scandinavians, and mm -hmm. the Americans. I, I, I you know, it, it just seems. I was talking about this on my channel the other day, and and a lot of my fellow producers were always ranting on about how well, probably because we don't have a presence here. But I, I've got friends here that are, are very well known in Germany. 
but no one knows who they are here. It's probably the best way to be. You yeah. can walk in the street, no one sure. cares. <laughs> you. But um, Tom, there's so many things I want to ask you. Um, let's talk about your your. Okay, let's start off with Assemblage Twenty Three. How did you How did you come up with that? I wish I had a really interesting story to tell about this, <laughs> but I really don't. It's Google, Google I, yeah. I, I basically I um I, I wanted something that had alphabetical and numerical um, elements in it. You know, at the time there were a lot of bands like Front Two Four Two, By God Twenty, Block Fifty Seven, and I, I always thought it added sort of an impersonal dystopian kind of feel to it. Like you know, it was just one of a number or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really anything more interesting uh, than that. I'm afraid. Okay, no, that's fine. I, I love your, I love your honesty. Um, now let's talk about your. Um, are you musically trained, or are you just like like me? You just kind of taught yourself. You just fell in love with music, and I, I'm pretty much self-taught. I yeah. after I had done it for a while, I thought maybe I should take piano lessons just to see, um, it, you know, if I could. Uh, improve my skills and I, I found my teacher was great but I found that I was being spending more time unlearning things that I was doing you know incorrectly yeah uh, than I was learning new stuff and I realized you know I don't really need you know I, I can play by ear I don't really need to learn to read sheet music Absolutely. and I just went on learning myself and, and practicing on my own so Absolutely. year of piano lessons but practically speaking pretty much self-taught that's the whole thing. I always find because I pretty much taught myself as well, and I got to a point where I thought, "Oh, let me go for piano lessons," and it was a nightmare. I just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's that whole thing you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of thing. And I, you know, I just you know, and then of course I've got friends who can play like piano grade eight level, and you put the book in front of them, and you take the book away, they can't play, and then right, I can like exactly. Have, how are you doing this? <laughs> you know, so I suppose it's just a different way of doing it. But now you're. As I say, what I, if I can just, as I say, there's a lot we can talk about, but I want to focus on just a few songs just to make a, and I'm going to put links to the description below because I know that the people on my channel that haven't heard of you are going to love you. Because Thank you. Thank you. I'm just, I, I'm not, I'm really, uh, and guys, can I just say to my subscribers there, Tom hasn't paid me any money to say this. I just think, uh, Tom. The checks to you after this. Yeah, the checks to you after this. Yeah, PayPal. <laughs> I, I just, you know, um, I, I don't know if you've watched any of my videos, Tom, but um, I have. Yeah, I think so. I've got, I'll, I'll send you a check for that as well. But uh, <laughs> I think you know, without being negative towards, but I, I always like to have a go at the mainstream. You know, it's kind of like my art teacher used to tell me, Mrs. Byrne, oh, God rest her soul. She always used to say to me, Vaughn, if you want to be in with a man in the street, you need to lower your standards, and that is so evident with you know, mainstream music, but we're not even going to waste our, our breath on that. Um, but now if we, if we come to a song like Lullaby, sure. so, I mean, mate, that, 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 as I said, I read that in the, I, it was a nighttime. I was sitting watching TV and I, it, and I listened to this and I was reading the lyrics and I literally had tears rolling down my cheeks and I put it on my channel the next days. And I think my words were, fucking hell you need to listen to this and so and i can't remember who the guy was but he came on there and he's he, i i think it was uh an australian subscriber of mine or shane parry is a really really witty guy and he's always like quirky and funny but he said something like oh my god i'm just sitting in the dark here and listening to this oh my god oh my god so you've definitely, <laughs> That's great. definitely and you know what i like about that tom um your music's dark but it has soul I, I think this, you get a lot of these people that jump onto this kind of gothic bandwagon, you know, and they put the makeup on and they do this, we are the sons and daughters of darkness, and it just comes across <laughs> as ridiculous. But I think yours is dark without wanting to be dark. It's just, but it's got that warmth. And nothing better illustrated than that song, Lullaby. I am going to do a piano uh, cover of that. Fantastic. Uh, piano, yeah, awesome. and, and uh, yeah. I, I just really feel I'm, I'm going to do it in a different way, but I'm just so inspired by that song. Now, let's talk about your writing process. Do you typically sit down at a piano, at a keyboard, or are you groove-based? It, it varies. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll start with a lyric, mm -hmm. you know, even just a phrase or something like that, or, um, 
you know, melody, and then you figure out how to build, you know, pair the melody with the bass line and chords and that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes I'll just sit down and I'll just start to kind of improvise with like a piano sound or something like that, something kind of generic so that the sound isn't kind of shaping the, the writing process. Yes. And I'll, I'll play until something comes up. But, you know, strangely enough, uh, what happens more often than not is that I get my ideas when I'm not in the studio. So when I'm walking around somewhere, I'll get an idea for a melody and I'll, you know, find somewhere private and hum it into my phone. And when I get home, I can yeah. adjust it. But for, for whatever reason, a lot of my musical inspiration happens when I'm not in front of a keyboard. Yeah, they always say the best ideas happen in the shower. That's what Einstein yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, that's interesting. And, and what I liked, what I instantly like about your, uh, your music, Tom, is it you're not shy to use melody that uh, i'm going to be doing a video soon on like what the fuck has happened to melody you know and a lot of songs these days it, they seem to be really like groove based yeah but I, I say like if i take a song like lullaby um you know and and with a lot of your songs as with all good with some good electronic music like your with your songs you can strip the electronics away and play it on a piano and it still works because it's, your song's not based on technology. You're using technology because that, that is how those are the instruments you use. But take away the technology and you play on the piano, you've got a beautiful song there. So, okay, so as you say, your ideas come sort of from anywhere and then you just put them down, which is the best way. Yeah. To, yeah. Tech, I, iPhones have been the best thing to happen for me as far as, uh, you know, because I can either call up a little synth app and figure out what the how to play the melody or I can hum it to the voice recorder and, and do it later. And I, I lose way fewer ideas than I used to uh, mm. long ago. OK, well, that's interesting. So, um, OK, so that's that's how your ideas come to you. So let's talk about production now. Do you produce everything or do you work with a mix engineer and a fellow producer? What's your process? Uh, I do everything except for the mastering. Um, oh, you do the mixing as well, the final mixing. Yeah. Um, mastering is, is something that I understand, but I find extremely tedious. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. And yeah. by the time I've, I've reached the mastering stage, I've heard the songs hundreds of times, and I don't really think I can give an objective ear to it from, from that standpoint. Um, but, yeah, I do, do all the production myself. Um, uh, you know, back in the day, I started using tape. Um, yeah. So it was it was a huge leap forward when I you know switched over to doing uh, using a DAW. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think people of my generation who you know started in tape or you know the analog world and, and where things were slightly less convenient um, have a greater appreciation for what the new technology can do because it's like man this would have taken me hours back yeah. in the day. I find this, uh, Tom, with the younger producers is like they'll, they'll slap something on and you want to say, you do not know how difficult that was <laughs> yeah. ago, because they got no appreciation of it. But yeah. also, and um, as we talk about necessity being the mother of invention, I find that technology is sometimes our biggest downfall because, you know, I always talk about people, we, you know, people who can't finish records. Back in the day, you had to commit, you had to get yeah. it out. But yeah, um, I, I think the... the it sounds um, it sounds like it wouldn't make sense, but but to me, one of the most valuable things you can do to increase your creativity is to impose limitations. Yes. You know, whether that's saying, okay, I'm only going to use this particular synth, and I'm going to make a song with nothing but this synth. Mm -hmm. You'll probably come up with much more interesting results because you're going to try harder to make it sound different, or yeah. it's going to take you in directions that it wouldn't be if you were just calling up, you know, 30 different soft synths and, you know, cruising okay. through presets. So I, I, I think um, what you're saying is right. Like technology has made things easier, but it's also given us so many options that it can be counterproductive. There's that procrastination that leads to paralysis and not being able to make a decision. Yeah. I find that a lot. Could you tell us what synthesizers you, you typically use? Is it in the box, out the box, a combination of both? Uh, it's a combination. Um, I, I think, you know, in the past few years, I think we've arrived at the point where software synthesizers are more or less indistinguishable from the real thing when you're putting them on a record. Uh, Just letting my cat out, yeah? Oh, no worries. Um, um, yes, that's true, yes. 
So I've always used kind of a, a 50 50 approach with that. But of course, you know, software offers um, flexibility and it offers flexibility. And there's also, you know, you're not going to find a, a hardware granular synth or some, some of this stuff is like, mm. is done better on a computer than it is okay. on a, on a, on a piece of hardware. So uh, I think they both have a lot to offer and I, I still, you know, I grew up with hardware. So the immediacy of it still yeah. really appeals to me versus pushing a mouse around on a screen, which is not quite as fun. I don't think. I think I always talk about this. There's this, um, you get these people that purists and I think it was Gary Newman who said in an interview once, and I'm just paraphrasing the way he said it. They said, um, you know, when people get into these debates about analog versus digital, Gary Newman said something like, if that's your focus, then you shouldn't be a musician. Your, <laughs> yeah, your only focus should be to make the best possible record. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, your, your, your focus is there to make the best sound. doesn't matter. And, that, and, and, and what I always say is, Tom, the listening public don't care. Right. And, and you that's, know, that's what I, that's what I've always said when, when yeah. I've gotten in, in conversations about this with people is, yeah. are you making the record for music listeners or are you making it for other musicians? This is true. And if you're making it for other musicians, you're probably not going to make any money, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you know, I've got this segment on my channel called Geek Talk where we, we go deeply into synthesizers and stuff. And a lot of people send me like their demos and, and you know, like I, I do a bit of coaching as well of, you know, up and coming artists. And, and sometimes, you know, people send me these soundscapes of like weird sound. And I appreciate it as a, as a musician and a producer, but I'm thinking where you're going with this, because most people don't care about all the, the nuances and stuff. And this is where, as I say, I can't bring it back to like your music. Um, I played it to my fiance and she liked it. She doesn't really like dark music uh, or she hates, she calls depressed mode as she calls it. <laughs> she liked yours because she said it had like a, 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 she said it has got light and soul to it. So I think what I'm trying to point out is that, you know, it, these people that are so focused on the gear that they that, that, that they are unable to actually produce or you know come up with yeah. good material. At, at, at the end of the day, the most important thing is the song. Uh, absolutely. And you know you can go back and you can listen to some of these you know really old blues records you know recorded in the twenties and thirties, yeah, exactly. and technically speaking, the sound quality is terrible. Exactly. But that sound quality is almost inherent in that style of music. Like that's almost a feature, not a bug, you know? So, you know, a, a song is going to, is going to, going to be a great song, whether you record it on, you know, your voicemail or whether you record it on, you know, a state of the art pro tools rig. Correct. It's great to have that technical ability and to have that focus on that stuff, but only if it's not, at the expense of the actual actual songs because the songs are what people relate to not the technology obviously you're a musician but do you in your process i mean you obviously fall into this trap do you ever get to a point where you you try and make it better and try and make it better and try you, oh, yeah, yes <laughs> do you do you sort of how, how do you impose do you impose like limitations where you got okay i've got to have it finished by this date or do you just have yeah you, uh deadlines are really the most effective thing for me because I will tweak it forever. Yeah. Um, I've gotten better about it though, as, as I've gotten older, um, in, in realizing that you have to prioritize what you're working on. You know, yeah. is, is this really going to make a difference to anybody except for me? This is true. And a lot of people won't hear the differences and they won't appreciate right. them. Either. Yeah, this is true. So that's, that's the difficult thing. It's interesting because in the song damaged, um, actually, in, in Lullaby as well, you managed to achieve a really deep, deep sound without distorting. What is the secret behind that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I like to use uh, one, one, kind of one of the holdovers from when I was using software since where they w didn't quite have that same mojo that the hardware has. Yeah. I got real into using um, saturation effects. Oh, and that sort of thing yeah. that they sort of add the harmonics that you get out of um, hardware more readily than you get out of um, you know more pristine software synthesizers. So yeah. I usually process the bass with some form of saturation or distortion to give it weight and to give it um, you know some presence. You get those extra harmonics in there that um, make it stick out a little bit more in the mix without having to process it you know, within an inch of its life. Hmm. 
did you always want to be a musician? Uh, no. Uh, what, 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 I mean, what, what, what was your aptitude in school? What were you good at and what did you think you would do? I was, uh, growing up, I was pretty good at, uh, at drawing. Okay. And I went through, <laughs> I went through a period where I thought I wanted to be a cartoonist. Okay. Um, my, my, my whole family has, uh, on my dad's side and my mom's side to an extent had, um, kind of artistic abilities. So I, I kind of followed in that, um, in that, uh, their footsteps in that sense. And, uh, then when I really started noticing music and discovered music, particularly electronic music, my focus really shifted um, away from that visual stuff to stuff having to do with sound. And uh, what, I mean, what, and, and what would you say is your main sort of fan base? Would, would, would you say it's very, would you say it's, it's very sort of a male uh, dominated fan base? Yeah, I think I think we trend more male, yeah. um, and and probably you know more middle aged at this point. Like our fan base has kind of aged with us, which is not to say that we haven't been getting new fans and younger fans as well. But um, you know, a lot of the people who were there for the beginning of the band when you know we started putting out records on on a label um, have kind of followed us along on our our journey. So. It's always nice when we go out on tour to see, you know, familiar faces. It yeah. is. And, y you know, Tom, what's always nice about the sort of over 40s is um, sometimes they're the ones, I mean, I have friends and, they, you know, when I release music and uh, they say, oh, where can we hear it? I say, oh, you can stream it. They're like, no, 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 I want the CD. They're, <laughs> yeah. You know, and they're actually the great ones because they, they, they actually want the hard copies and, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that is really an advantage. Um that I've been really conscious about is, is, you know, fans of this generation, a lot of them still buy music. And now, you know, there's new generations of music fans who have never known a world without streaming or where mm -hmm. paying for music was even a thing. So, um, that's quite a shift. So do you, um, do you sell many, do you, when you release, do you release CDs? Uh, do you do vinyl? Um, yeah, we've done CD and vinyl for yeah. the um, for the past couple releases. Um, you know, vinyl's been really hot for the you know the past few years. Um, CD sales have definitely gone down. Um, yes, more it's hard more to people are, are are definitely streaming, but when we tour is when we sell more CDs because you know people want to have something signed, exactly. and you can't really sign an MP3 or an audio stream, <laughs> at least not yet. Yeah, exactly. I think the whole, I mean, I did a video last week where I was kind of ranting on about the streaming, you know, how I think, I think, I think Spotify, you've got to stream to earn a dollar. You've got to be streamed like 279 times or something like that. It's, it's something, it's excessive. something, it's something absolutely insane. And, um, anyway, I suppose, you know, that's the way the world's going. You've got to go, you've got to kind of go with it. You can't yeah. on rant against it. But, um, so um, I, I was on your website early on and uh, just having a browse on there. Have you got any tours coming up? Um, I'm, I'm working on a new album right now, so there won't really be any full tours until, um, in, until that's done. Uh, we have a couple uh, upcoming dates. Um, we have on the September 14th, we're playing in Newark at QXTs. Okay. Um, and that'll be a double bill of... Also, my my band, my side project Helix, will be opening the band, yeah. so I'll be opening for myself. Uh, um, and then October fourth, we're playing Absolution Fest down in Florida. Mm -hmm. A bunch of great other bands. Um, and then we have some things that we're starting to book in Europe for uh, next year, but it's a little bit early to to start talking about those. But we always try to to you know do shows throughout. The, the year so that people don't forget us <laughs> oh see so yes yeah and, and and i think this um we talk about depeche mode who's one of my favorites they have this thing of releasing an album every four years you know i, th I think for a current artist you know with things moving so quickly you've just got to really be in people's faces or they just yeah you. um oh yes this is the thing sorry I, I had a moment where my my brain just switched off you know i've been doing so many long hours lately i wanted to ask you about your artwork do you do that yourself? Because you say you draw, you do draw. Oh no, no, no! I've I've, I've uh, hired artists to uh, okay. to do those. Yeah, because you've got this. Your your art your artwork's very iconic. You've got a real. You've got like a thread running through through everything. 
Yeah, I, I, I do like to have some degree of consistency to it. I, I mean, I think the, the early artwork was pretty haphazard, but I think we've kind of developed a visual style that even though, you know, we, we've had a couple different um, visual artists do the work, I think it's main, it's remained consistent kind of to that look. Yeah. So, uh, so as you say, back to your production period, your, 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 uh, producing you, as you say, you write and you produce everything yourself. You just don't do the mastering yourself. Right. That's right. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, uh, the mastering is something that's best left to a mastering engineer. How do you yeah. feel about these? How do you feel about these? Uh, um, I know what the answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> How do you feel about these uh, services? And we won't mention any names where you upload your music and it just masters it for you. What do you think of that? Um, I, I mean, I, I've, I've heard some results, so they were okay, you know, mm -hmm. but you would get much better results from a pair of human ears and, and somebody who can make decisions that are not just based on, um, you know, that are based on experience and, and not just, uh, you know, machine Al learning yeah, and algorithms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think uh, in a way it's good because it democratizes things a little bit to where somebody who's just a hobbyist who maybe can't really afford to pay a professional mastering engineer can, can get something that's going to be, you know, of a, um, you know, relatively decent quality. Uh, but it's, it's not a replacement for a, for a human uh, engineer yeah, at all. Yeah. I don't, at least not yet. Maybe it'll get there. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think this, this is what uh, Jean-Michel, Jean, are you a Jean-Michel Jean fan? Yes, yeah. A lot of his, um, uh, it's a bit like Gary Newman, his whole, um, a, lot of, a lot of his music was based on a world that we're, you know, dark and, you know, like androids and stuff taking over. Um, so Jean-Michel Jean, uh, his music has addressed that um, inevitable notion, really, that the machines will take over and, mm. or not take over, but, you know, our, our place as humans is becoming... Um, pretty much compromised because you know the machines can do so much, and we see that in automation in all kinds of things at the moment. But of course, um, no computer is going to be able to write a, a ballad like Lullaby. Um, come Let's back to that. That's, 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 <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble if they can. But Tom, um, I think when I said I was going to interview some people, are like no way, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you've actually you've actually got a much bigger following uh, than you may think you have. Oh, it's good to know. I was, as I say, I was very happy to to discover your music, and I do listen to it quite a lot now. I'm really. Oh, really, thank you. Yeah, you it's it's on my playlist, and uh, I'm going to put links to all the stuff below here. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely welcome. And I would like us to. We'll obviously keep in touch, and I would like to, uh, you know, later on, you know, have another chat with you every now and then, for being very respectful of your time. For instance, you're, you're working on a new album now. Yes. Um, when is that, are you not liberty to say, or have you got an idea when? Don't really know yet. Um, beginning of next year sometime, but okay. I, I, I'm not far enough along where I can feel confident enough to say a certain date, but, uh, cause you're still right. Cause uh, th there's this idea these days that it's better to put out singles and, uh, EPs, but I suppose in your case, you're as an established artist, you can. Do as you say. You'd like the whole body of work. Yeah, I. You know, I mean, it's really it's just force of habit for me. Um, I, that's not to say that I won't maybe switch over to doing EPs or something like that. I, I think there's something to be said for releasing smaller amounts of music more frequently, yeah. in terms of you know publicity. Um, sure. But uh, you know, this is still working for us pretty well in terms of you know putting an album out, touring the U.S., touring Europe, doing one-off shows in other countries. Um, it, it's the balance has worked out pretty well for us so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you you do a lot of touring. Yes, yeah, right. quite a bit. You do quite a lot. Um, how many albums have you released to date? Is it about eight, nine? Yes, uh, it's eight, 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 eight proper albums. There's like you know, uh, some remix albums and stuff in there as well. But uh, yeah, the main uh, of course are eight albums. That's great, Tom Shear. So thank you so much for this. Um, Thank you. I'm going to put links to all this below. Um, I'm going to put this on my Facebook page as well. I'm so grateful to you for your time, and I'm so good to meet you. And I hope, I hope we'll meet you in the UK sometime. So, as I said, we get we you're, you're going to be a regular chat, uh, a regular um, show on my channel, hopefully, because I'd love to keep. Up yeah, to that'd be my pleasure. Um, and okay, so then what I'm going to do is now, Tom, we're going to hang up, and okay. then um, I'm going to hope that I've recorded it. Okay. 
But if I haven't, you can just send the recording to me and um, yep. we'll take it from there. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Tom. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. It was great talking to you. Wish you all the best and we'll, we'll be in touch. Okay, I'll talk to you later. See you soon. Cheers, my Bye. friend. Bye-bye. So there you have it, guys. Tom Shear from Assemblage 23. I would urge anyone who is an electronic music fan to check him out. It's absolutely awesome. I really, really like it. Guys, I'm going to leave links to in the description below to all of Tom Shear and Assemblage 23's music. As I say, do check him out. And I hope to interview Tom soon on the channel once again. Guys, thank you as always. Please leave your comments below. Let me know what you think of Assemblage 23. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Take care.